Next speaker uh, is Jacek Kowodziej, and he will be speaking about uh, something called the GIL, alias uh, Global Interpreter Lock. So if you don't know what the GIL is and why should you care, here is the speaker. If you ask Google, does Python support threats? It's not hard to come across answers like this one. That the, it does not. Hmm. Let's go back in time a little bit to the year uh, 1992. Uh, this is me in 1992, believe it or not. <laughs> Here you can, whoa, whoa, that was fast. <laughs> come on, come on. Here you can see uh, Java and JavaScript in 1992. If it's not obvious, yes, they didn't exist back then at all. Um, same, uh, here you can see uh, consumer grade CPUs that you could just go to the store and grab off the shelf consumer grade CPUs with multiple cores. Same thing, they didn't exist in 1992. Neither in Bratislava, neither in Slovakia, sorry, never in Poland where I came from, and uh, never, never in, uh, in USA. And uh, here is a logo of Python, C Python to be precise, in 1992, with threading support in 1992 with the GIL also. So this is clear, clearly wrong. And it has been wrong uh, since uh, 1992. There's also this statement. What about this one? Is it true, is it false? Who thinks it, is it false? Huh, yep. It's also not true. Uh, C Python can easily be run across multiple cores. Just, run your application uh, with, uh, with uh, multiple threads, and you will see that the process is using multiple cores, indeed. How about this one? Is it true, is it false? Who thinks is it, it is false? Okay, so this is the third one, and obviously it must be different, so it is actually true. But why, what, why is it true? Uh, let's, go, let's go through this uh, thing by thing, topic by topic. Uh, I'm Jacek Kowodziej. Um, I run long distances. I go from one metal show to another, from one hill to another, to uh, sometimes taking pictures. And I also live with these two cats on the right. Uh, if you wanna talk about any of these things, uh, just uh, come find me later. Uh, day to day, um, day to day, I'm a principal software engineer at Allegro, uh, where I'm working with teams responsible for searching offers, displaying them, uh, and recommending them. And uh, I'm here to talk about the GIL. Uh, to talk about the GIL, uh, it's very, very useful to go through some some topics uh, before that. And uh, this is a long list of topics. It's very boring, but after we uh, load all this information into our brain's caches, the GIL will be very, very easy to understand. So, the first thing. Uh, the GIL is to some degree about parallelism. So, what even is parallelism? Well, uh, let's make a comparison. Uh, to run something in parallel, means run, to run it physically one by one with, within this, uh, within the like, same time. It needs, to, uh, it needs to physically be in parallel. It means we need to physically have multiple physical units of execution. So let's imagine we, uh, we run two threads, uh, one by one, one beside each other. Uh, one thread runs on a, on one core of our CPU, and the second 
thread runs on the second, uh, second uh, core of our CPU. This means to run in parallel. Meanwhile, there's also something we call concurrency. So parallelism is a form of concurrency, but we don't need to, um, well, but for something to be concurrent, it doesn't need to be parallel. So in order to have concurrent execution, we don't need uh, physical separate, uh, separate hardware. And uh, concurrency can be easily, easily can be achieved uh, on a single core. Uh, next thing, what even are threads? Mm, let's start with processes. So a process uh, in computer science ling lingo uh, is um, something that consists of one or more threads. It's also an instance of an application, an instance of uh, of an application that has a uh, shared memory. All the threads share the same memory space. And um, in CPython specifically, um, when we are talking about threads, uh, today we will be talking about the threading module, uh, which uses something called system threads, or kernel threads, threads or native, or POSIX. Uh, they are mostly interchangeable within the context of, of this talk. This is as opposed to all the other forms of concurrency. And there are very, very many, like asynchronous, uh, asynchronous um, libraries, starting with AsyncIO, but not ending on AsyncIO. Anything called green threads or greenlets or coroutines or many, many others uh, are forms of concurrency. This is not what the threading in CPython is about. Um, and last thing, uh, a particular thread, a single thread, at the given moment can be freshly created, meaning it is ready to be run, it can currently be running, or it can be waiting or be blocked by some action. What action they, they, this may be? Um, Two, uh, the, uh, two, two, two next things are locks and system calls. So locks are a tool to prevent something called race conditions. And um, it would take uh, another lecture to, to, um, to explain race, race conditions, uh, but uh, you, can, uh, you can go through it later. Um, but uh, in a very, very, very short uh, description would be Imagine you have a shared resource within your application, shared between threads, and multiple threads wants to access this shared resource. Each time you encounter a situation like this, or rather your application encounters uh, a situation like this, you need to think whether there can be a race condition uh, possible uh, within that section of the code or not. If yes, this is, um, this is a section called critical section. And uh, a lock, or rather locks, are a tool uh, for, uh, for preventing that. Um, also, you, you may come across uh, a name mutex. It comes from mutual exclusion, meaning um, only one thread can access, uh, access a particular um, part of memory, access it exclusively. Um, and uh, to, to, to complete the, the picture, uh, a lock can be held or locked, or it can be released or unlocked. Mm. Another thing, just beside locks, uh, there is something in uh, operating system world called system calls. This is basically an API of your kernel, of your operating system's kernel, to various resources. Uh, for example, for I.O. access, uh, and it may be access to the, a disk, a network, or some other, uh, other fancy hardware. Uh, there are system calls for, uh, for controlling processes. Even a very, a very simple thing called sleep is also a, a system call. And um, system calls may be blocking, meaning um, your code makes a system call, 
and then the operating system uh, responds with, okay, I will block you for now, you need to wait for, uh, for, um, for a result of that system call. Huh. Another topic uh, which we need to uh, remind ourselves about is memory man management. In CPython, there is a very simple, yet very effective in many, many cases, uh, type, of type of memory management uh, that is reference counters. So any Python object within your Python, CPython process has a number attached to it. And this, this number represents how many references are there to that particular object. And uh, the interpreter, as soon as it sees that this number was redu reduced to zero, it sees that, okay, this object is no longer needed because no one, no, uh, no one holds any reference to it, so I can free that memory. And for the most, most part, uh, this is pretty much the, um, the optimal or a sufficient way to manage memory. Uh, for the most part, because you can have a, you can have reference circuits. Uh, that's in a second. But reference counters uh, are a shared resource between uh, between threads. Because uh, remember, uh, your threads within a particular Python C Python process, uh, all they can uh, they can all access uh, the the same objects. And um, as shared resources go, yes, they need to be in some way protected uh, because they are shared resources and they are subject to race conditions. Um, there's also a mechanism um, of garbage collection uh, in, in CPython. This is mostly or exclusively uh, for, um, for detecting reference cycles uh, because when you have a re reference cycle, um, this number of uh, re references does not ever go to zero, so you need to detect it, or rather CPython needs to detect it in order to free that memory. Uh, another option for, uh, for our programming language uh, to manage memory would be to have a tracing garbage collector. This is more robust mechanism, but it's also uh, much more complicated. And you can see uh, you can see tracing garbage collections, for example, in in, in Java uh, virtual machines or C sharp. Uh, yeah, this is a trade off, of course. Uh, whether you want to have a mm, more complex uh, system or simpler versus uh, versus how much does it interact with uh, with the mm, let's say interpreters inter internals and. Uh, Finally, the end of this list of prerequisites would be the Python bytecode. What is it then is Python bytecode? Uh, sometimes you may come across a, questions, a, a question, is Python compiled or interpreted? And the answer to that is yes. Um, why is that? Uh, because when you run any Python code, uh, by CPython, uh, it first gets compiled into bytecode, which may look like this. For a very, very simple uh, two lines of code, the bytecode looks like this. Uh, this is just an eye candy for you, uh, but uh, the f on the right, you can, see, you can see a few instructions of bytecode that is interpreted by the CPython interpreter. Uh, so, once it it, uh, it gets compiled, then it gets run by, by the interpreter uh, and finally executed. So, finally, back to the GIL. It stands for global, global interpreter log. And uh, yes, as any log, it protects shared resources uh, so that your overall uh, program is um, safe to run in multiple threads. Let's uh, simplify it that way. And um, it protects many things, starting with uh, reference counters, but also uh, it protects C mutable Python data structures. And it doesn't only uh, represent something that you can mutate from the level of your Python code, meaning it does not only mean 
dictionaries or lists or sets or you know the drill, but it also protects strings and other structures that you can uh, modify via C API underneath. Um, there is also some internal global state in any interpreter, uh, and it also needs protecting uh, atomic APIs. And uh, the very important thing to realize here is that CPython is over 30 years old. Quite a few lines of code in Python and touching Python and using Python have have been written uh, throughout these years. And um, all of this code since 1992 assumed that there is, th there is GIL protecting, uh, protecting threat safety of, uh, of any code in CPython. So it's not very easy to, 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 to change that reality. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's very useful to, to know that the GIL does need, doesn't need to be um, held by a, by a thread, for example, when we are waiting for I.O. So imagine we have two, two threads in our application. One it calls for, uh, for some file on, on a disk, and a second one wants to run. The first one, while waiting for I.O. access, doesn't need to hold the guild. The other one can easily just execute, for example, making some, uh, making some computations. Um, when we are using uh, libraries, for example, NumPy, um, it can easily um, operate on, uh, on data structures that are not Python objects. And uh, while, it, while this uh, library does that, it doesn't need to hold the GIL. It can release it uh, to, to some other thread. And, um, this is the part of the, of, uh, of the presentation uh, that will briefly um, show you how the GIL operates. Uh, it's very dense, and I don't have much time, so I'll go through it quickly. Uh, and um, either mm, you, you can choose either to, to take a nap here, or uh, or uh, buckle your seatbelts and let's go through through it. So as a warm up, a single thread example. Uh, we have a thread that just executes some, uh, some instructions. It just goes. At some point, let's say it calls for, uh, for I.O. and uh, it gets blocked, and it is waiting for, uh, for this uh, system call to complete. Uh, life is simple. Uh, we don't need to talk about the GIL uh, here. Scenario two. We have two threads. And the uh, first one is running. We uh, create a second thread. At first, it will, uh, it will wait for the operating system to, to choose it to be run. That's a, that's a very, uh, very important thing to, to realize. The first actor that, uh, that has anything to say in, um, in which thread will go next is the operating system. It's not Python. Python will have something to say in this matter after the operating system chooses a thread to be run. The first, th the, the, the first would be uh, the operating system. So at some point, operating system uh, says, OK, there's a thread, a thread waiting, it, uh, is, and I, I'm choosing it to, to, to be run. And it gets chosen. The first thing it sees is that, OK, the GIL is currently locked. So uh, I, cannot, I cannot run any, uh, any Python bytecode. I need to do something about it. And uh, this something is um, calling a, a special function, special um, uh, call, called CV wait. Uh, this is, um, it basically means wake me up when either the gill is released or the timeout happens, the timeout uh, called the interval. Uh, whichever, uh, whichever things uh, comes first, wake me up and, and, and run me. And it goes to the waiting state, because this uh, CV wait is a, uh, is a system, uh, operating system thingy. Um, in this scenario, uh, the GIL will be released before this timeout happens. 
so at some point, the first thread releases the gil. Uh, it signals through the operating system to this other uh, to the uh, to this other thread that the gil was released. The second thread uh, gets woken up by by the operating system. It checks uh, whether the uh, no sorry uh, it checks who was the last holder of the gil. This is uh, this is a system of cooperation between threads in C Python. It's very deliberate. Uh, it's, uh, it checks who was the last holder. If it would be me, then okay, I, I have just been running, so I, I, I want to give some other thread a chance to run. But in this scenario, okay, it wasn't me, I can get the gil. So this is what it does. It requires the gil uh, for itself and spins, it runs. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the story continues. Uh, the first scenario, uh, let's start with in, this, uh, in this section, and um, this time the interval, this timeout will actually happen. So at this point, uh, the second thread gets uh, woken up by the, uh, by the operating system, but not due to um, the gil being released, but due to timeout happening. Uh, so the second thread says, okay, the gil is still locked. Um, it, sees a, it sets a special uh, variable um, called gil uh, drop request. This variable, uh, yeah, in, uh, sorry, it sets it sets this variable and uh, and calls cv wait again with the with the uh, same um, with the same parameters but with a different intention. And this is not a bug; <laughs> it's a feature. Uh, what uh, what happens then? This gil drop request um, variable gets checked by uh, by a thread on each turn of the evaluation loop uh, in the interpreter. So, so um, whenever uh, whenever this variable gets uh, gets set to one, a thread that is currently running uh, will see oh it got set to one. So I will immediately uh, drop the gil at this point. This is what uh, what happens uh, here. Uh, the first thread uh, releases the gil, signals that it was released just as before. Uh, itself calls the CV wait, uh, but not uh, not with the intention of waiting for the gil. It's the it's for the, it's in the intention for um, seeing whether a different thread actually acquired it. Mm. So again, uh, the second thread uh, sees, uh, sees, uh, gets woken up, uh, checks who was the last holder, acquires the gil, and runs. But uh, before that, it signals that, hey, I acquired the gil. It signals it to the first thread, and it's the first thread that uh, resets this gil drop request. And this may be confusing a little bit, uh, and it is in the scenario where you only have two threads, but with more threads, it is another form of cooperation so that all threads within a process uh, can uh, can have some chance to actually run. Uh, I didn't I didn't say uh, I didn't say it uh, before. Sorry. Um, there will be a link at the end of the presentation to this slide, so uh, don't bother uh, taking pictures or uh, or noting. Um, and also, there will be links to uh, to to this. Uh, this meaning these are the files that actually contains the gills code in any uh, 3.4 plus versions of Python. Uh, I'm pointing this out because the gil uh, the, the gil code it's in C. It's, it's written in C, of course, but it's very readable. It's very well commented. So uh, if you are uh, interested more uh, in in the gil. I encourage you to, to take a look. Um, and at this point, if you, memor if you memorized like a third of this information I presented to you, uh, you will easily, uh, you should easily uh, be, um, be hired as a, as a Python software engineer. Uh, so fingers crossed. Um, and um, you probably heard about, uh, about the gil being a big problem in in in, in Python world, and uh, why does it still why is it still there? Well, there well there were multiple um, approaches to uh, to getting rid 
of the guild, um, all of them need to meet some expectations. And these expectations are, uh, for multi-threaded code, uh, the performance needs to scale with the numbers, of course. Like that's the, that would be the reason to get rid of the guild, so that's kind of obvious. Um, another expectation is uh, that uh, a single-threaded code does uh, not need, uh, sorry, uh, must not be any slower than with the guild, and believe it or not, it's not as easy as you would think. Um, second big expectations is that um, after getting rid of, rid of the gill, uh, the C Python needs to retain the compatibility, backwards compatibility for any C extension. And third, uh, third one, uh, after the gill removal, the C Python's source code does need to be like significantly more complex, and it's also not very easy to achieve. Uh, and there were many attempts. Uh, first one, first like first Googleable Googleable one would be uh, uh, did happen like just four years after the introducing of, of multi-threading in Python, and uh, as you would expect, it didn't really work. Um, Twenty years later, there's, there was uh, um, a more complex patch. Uh, that not only removed the guild, because that would be stupid, uh, it did not only uh, replace a, one giant lock with, um, with fine-grained locking about, uh, around uh, shared resources. Uh, it did some more things that I don't have time to, to talk here, but you will see, uh, you will see um, a link to the, to, the, um, to the description on my webpage. Um, there was a gilectomy project which came about when I first created this presentation in 2016. And just a few months after I gave this talk for the first time, the gilectomy pretty much stopped, but here's that. Um, quite recently, um, there, came a, uh, there, there, there came an idea of using sub-interpreters uh, for achieving parallelism in C Python uh, in a single uh, in a single process. Uh, first part of it is uh, to make Gil work per interpreter, um, or rather per sub interpreter in C Python, and it it got uh, released in uh, 3.12 last year. Uh, the second part uh, would be to expose this functionality of sub interpreters. Um, for, for your Python code, uh, there is a pub. It wasn't, um, it wasn't accepted yet, uh, but fingers crossed for 3.14. And um, the, main f uh, the, the main attempt that is ongoing currently uh, is to make the gil optional in CPython. So um, it does not only introduce many, many changes to CPython code. Uh, I encourage you to read the pep. It's very readable uh, if you are interested in, interested in the topic. It also provides a compilation uh, time flag that disables the gil. So you can then run your C Python processes without the gil. And uh, the long term plan here is to make this uh, flag the default. Um, from what I uh, from what I see uh, by looking at uh, at uh, issues on GitHub, it's on track to be uh, implemented fully in 3.13, so in October this year. Um, so what happened to these expectations? Um, it's not that this uh, this pep uh, 703 is like technically magically uh, better. It's not li like the physics changed since uh, 1996, uh, the expectations changed uh, for, for removing the gill in CPython. So um, the single threaded code must not be significantly slower, because uh, making it not slower at all uh, kind of seems impossible. And um, instead, of, um, instead of assuring the backwards compa cap compatibility, which is also pretty much um, not uh, not achievable. Uh, 
CPython developers decided that they will provide the gradual migration path for, um, for the C extensions. And it will take quite a lot of time for that. It, it is designed as a multi-year project, but fingers crossed that will, it will succeed eventually. Uh, yeah, and what do we, um, what should we do in the meantime uh, during this multi-year project? Well, um, I hope this presentation, no, 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 not that I hope, I, I think this presentation will remain somehow relevant for, uh, for, for these few years. So, what to do in the meantime? It depends on what, what you are doing with Python. If you are writing a single-threaded, uh, purely Python code, basically nothing, <laughs> uh, because, uh, because you don't suffer uh, from, from the gill. Uh, if you are writing uh, Python, multi-threaded Python applications, uh, with, uh, sorry, single-threaded Python using uh, multi-threaded C extensions, um, your programs may use the, uh, the, your multiple cores already. Just run it and check it with, with, any, um, with any monitoring tool of your choice. If in doubt, uh, profile your code, see where are the bottlenecks, and uh, act accordingly. Um, if you're writing multi-threaded IO-bound code, for example, Flask applications run within Junicorn, uh, and you want to, to see where are the bottlenecks, start with profiling. Mm. And chances are uh, only adding more threads to run your application will be just enough to, uh, to use your resources uh, more optimally. Uh, if you're writing asynchronous IO bound code, for example, um, for example an, a fast, fast API application, um, you can start by just using multiple processes. Simple as that. Um, if you are ha ha having any doubts, profile. <laughs> and um, yeah, mm, if you're writing asynchronous applications with thread pools for some, uh, for example, for some database drivers that don't, don't have asynchronous um, counterparts, start with profiling. <laughs> uh, and try adding more threads to these thread pools, see what happens, uh, and then act accordingly. And finally, the only, the only situation where the gill is actually the problem is when you are writing multi-threaded CPU-bound code. So um, some heavy computations using pure Python. Start with profiling, as always. Uh, see where, uh, where the bottlenecks are. Um, and there are multiple options. You can try multiprocessing, which would be the balance between um, getting rid of the gill, um, gill problem, let's say, at the expense of inter-process communication. And uh, no, no quick pointers here. Uh, Sorry. You can, uh, we, we are, I'm, I'm speaking, yes. uh, that, 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 that's the last slide, I believe. Um, you, can, uh, you can offload uh, your um, CPU-intensive code, uh, CPU-intensive work to NC extension and try to look for some, uh, so for some that would serve your needs uh, or become a C expert and write your own. Uh, it, may be, it, it may look funny, but sometimes it's the optimal option. Uh, you can try Cyton with its no-gill uh, mm, decorator, uh, which will drop the gill uh, in, in, in a section that doesn't need the gill. And uh, finally, uh, sometimes using Python, or at least C Python, is not the best solution, sadly. But uh, keep in mind what your, uh, what your knowledge tells you. What, uh, where, where are you working in, uh, what environment, who, who maintains the, the code, so on, so, so on and so forth. Sometimes uh, choosing a different technology is the better answer. Weight your pros, pros and cons accordingly. Thank you very much. And again, profile, profile, profile. We, thank you. We have... We, uh, <laughs> sorry. We have several questions, but I guess that in last 10 or 15 minutes, the speaker actually answered most of these questions. So I would uh, kind of raise this one, and because we heard the thoughts on eliminating the jill, and uh, hopefully we understand what's the hassle now. And 
why remove the, the Gigil and why keep the Gigil? This was answered, in my opinion, fairly uh, data in detail. So can you can quickly deal with one or two questions before we run out of time? What are the differences between using forking and threading in Python? Uh, so f forking means to create a separate process so with its own memory, uh, but it's a complex topic. Come catch me later. And and the last question: How does the no gil keyword in Numba work under the under the hood? Well, I cannot speak about the implementation, um, but it seems that it does the same thing at, at in, as in Cyton. So it drops the gil, does its thing, uh, letting other threads in your C Python process do their their thing uh, in, in with with Python bytecode. And in the meantime, um, processing without the gill uh, in the in the same process. Yeah, this is pretty much all we have time for the questions. But if for those of you who asked the questions that were not answered, please find the speaker outside, and you can have a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Also, if you are interested in doing the lightning talks, you can already sign up. There are sheets outside, and now I believe the coffee break follows. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thank you.